Good evening. My name is Matt Wallace. I serve the Scottsdale Town Administrator. You're now viewing the meeting stream and recording for the Scottsdale Town Council work session held on Monday, March 14th, 2022. This meeting is held in compliance with the Virginia Framework Information Act, the state's open meeting laws, and the town of Scottsdale's coordinates on the continuity of government during the COVID 19 emergency. The meeting is open to the public, and everyone is welcome to attend and participate. There are a few different opportunities and ways to do that. The meeting is open here physically at the town hall on 401 Valley Street. The members of the public um, and council members may also participate um, remotely, um, either calling in on the phone or by joining us on our Zoom platform. If you're doing the meeting in the future or in the YouTube channel, thank you very much. The local time here now is 13 minutes until 7 o'clock. Which is the post start time for our meeting. We're still getting set up here in Summer Rock Farm. So, what I'll do is cut this um, audio and video feed for the next 15 minutes while we get everything together. Um, and you'll see us resume at 7 o'clock. So, if you want to skip ahead 13 minutes on the stream, um, you'll see us coming later. Thank you.
All right. <clears throat> Go ahead and open the work session. We've got a lot of stuff to cover tonight. Ask Chief Jenkins if he'd come forward and give us a report. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, Council members. Thank you for having me this evening. This uh, this update for you very quickly. Um, I'd like to take a couple minutes just to recognize uh, Tractor Supply and Palmyra. They donated uh, two full sets of pickup truck pool racks and a uh, local person, uh, local painter uh, in town uh, actually donated $100 to the police department for the racks. Uh, the $100 was given to the town clerk for the town's budget. I attended uh, Chief Ron Lance's uh, retirement ceremony on uh, February the 23rd. They were very appreciative to see the town participate. March the 2nd, I uh, attended the uh, Triad board meeting at the request of uh, Ron Farmer, who is their president of Triad. Uh, I think you will be happy to know, Mr. Fritzko, that uh, the uh, picnic table has been retrieved from the uh, pond out here at the back. It's uh, sitting at the uh, dam end of the, it was heavy. <laughs> it was waterlogged. Uh, the levy drill was scheduled for March the 13th, but it was postponed uh, due to this weekend's uh, weather. So it's been rescheduled for March the 22nd. And we're going to try an afternoon, an evening. A um, couple of significant calls for service. Uh, we took a report of a uh, stolen uh, black Dodge Charger from the tavern parking lot. Female was intoxicated, uh, giving her keys to an individual that she knew. And uh, the vehicle is still uh, stolen, reported stolen in NCIC Beeson, and uh, warrants have been obtained for the suspect. I responded during the uh, early morning hours of February the 23rd for a smell of gas. Uh, one of the uh, parents in the uh, neighborhood was at the bus stop and smelled an odor of gas. Fire department was notified. We checked the area yeah. of the uh, um, like, Harrison and Page. What I was told by the fire department was that um, typically when the uh, substation down at the uh, river builds up, it'll, it'll blow off that gas. And that might have been what that smell was that morning. Yeah. So you have the substation that, that powers the town itself. And then you have the substation that Towers the old plank. Mm -hmm. And that's the one we think that maybe the uh, smell is coming from. Mm -hmm. Check the churches and some houses with their tools, and we didn't find any gas leaks or anything. A couple of uh, community events. Uh, we attended uh, the um, free school event at uh, Scottsville Methodist Church on the 23rd. They were doing, uh, 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 I guess some educational things on vehicles and uh, officer uh, Tom Haley and myself took our, our police car down there and the kids seemed to enjoy that very much. Had our first meeting with uh, the pastor's uh, council. I first met with uh, Laura Stratton. That meeting went very well. And then um, I attended the uh, clergy collective meeting on March the 3rd at uh, St. Anne's. And uh, I think we're going to start now scheduling those types of meetings uh, once a month with the, uh, the clergy here in town. Uh, coffee with a cop. I think everyone here got notified that we'll be doing a coffee with a cop uh, with our partners at uh, Baines. But they've been very gracious to uh, host the coffee with a cop event on March the 21st. Uh, eight to ten. We do have. I did extend the invitation to the sector officers for uh, Albemarle PD as well. So hopefully they'll send some folks down here. I think they've got three or four police officers that work this area that are going to come by as well. Uh, just a brief uh, update on on our two auxiliary officers and the uh, time that they've donated to the uh, police department in the town during the month. Fifty nine hours. And you can see uh, what that equates to. Uh, the one's a little more expensive than the other simply because uh, it's all IT work. 
and he works for an IT company and that's what he gets paid per hour. Uh, department news, uh, I had 10 policies, but we've probably done over a dozen policies this, this uh, past month for our new policy manual. So the work on our policy manual continues to go very well. Uh, the ethernet in installation work was completed on March the 4th. And that's for us being able to upload our in-car camera and our uh, body worn camera video to the server. Um, I think you all will be happy to know that we did receive our new vehicle from GE Ford finally. <laughs> it did exist. Um, it's, it's in Greene County right now being marked up. So once I get that back, we'll make sure that Matt and you, you guys get uh, a picture of what it looks like, but it's, uh, it's a very nice vehicle. Mm. We were able to pick the vehicle up from Colonial uh, Auto and it's now in service. Uh, Officer Wood's been assigned to that vehicle. Uh, I did and was able to get Officer Wood scheduled to attend a 40 hour uh, crisis intervention training uh, April the 18th through the 22nd. He's currently in field training right now uh, with Officer Barnett. Uh, I was able to get all of our police department officers uh, qualified with ACPD in March. Started working, <coughs> excuse me, started working on our MOUs uh, with the County Police Department, Blue Banda County Sheriff's Office. Um, I know I sent the mayor a copy of the one that I sent to the county police department. And I also sent them to both Jim Bowling as well. So he's aware of what the sheriff's offices and the county police department's MOUs say. One thing I'm excited about is trying to uh, transition our police department, our officers at least, to a 10-hour uh, work schedule. I'm looking to really uh, do that on April the 3rd. 30th. And the reason behind my thought process on that is I really started looking at, um, you know, our resource allocation mm -hmm. and trying to figure out a better way to uh, capitalize on the resources that we have in the town. And I looked at a 10 hour work schedule and with, with the officers that I have, full time officers that I have, uh, we can actually put one on a rotation and then one on another rotation and out of a 28 day work cycle, actually have four work days in that work cycle where we have three of us working that day. So with the second person that will be scheduled to work evening shifts, I can actually tailor their schedule to a day shift and we can do uh, community policing initiatives during the day, we can do officers training. Uh, and we can also do some of our uh, uh, speed enforcement type activities if we need to have them here in the town. I still have not been able to get the uh, speed study back from the county yet, but I know that uh, Kate Kane is working on that. So as soon as I get that, I'll be able to understand a little bit more about what our issue is on Valley Street anyway. Mm -hmm. okay. Great. Yeah. And that's all I had for an update for you, unless you had some questions. I'm so sorry. I probably should know this, but what is MOU? Uh, mutual. Uh, it, it's a mutual. Uh, uh, for memo a memo of memorandum of understanding. Yeah. Thank you, Matt. That's sorry. what it is. Memorandum of understanding. MOU. Uh, Some of them say MOAs, um, you know, like a, a memo agreement or something like that, but it's MOU. But the, the sort of rules of engagement for how the agencies work together and help each other. Correct. Gotcha. Okay. Just a kind of a random question. Yes, um, sir. Sat this last Saturday, about 5 30 or 6, I saw somebody pulled over on Valley Street mm -hmm. on the right hand side. And then on the way to Charlottesville, I saw a couple of Albemarle County police cars going in the town. And I'm just wondering is that the charger theft or is this There's something different? Pardon? Something different. It was. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, so our officers have been doing some more of the selective enforcement here in the town, uh -huh. and uh, the county was actually responding. Uh, I'm assuming that you were probably seeing a deal. We did respond to a DOA this past weekend. Okay. Um, the county wanted us to assist them. Uh, we were able to use it as a training uh, okay. opportunity for our new police officer as well. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I was just wondering if there's a lot of police cars all heading That's towards Scottsville. That's what it was. <laughs> Greg, if you had time to look at the um, 
uh, number of citations written and the ones that are actually prosecuted to see if everything is going to court or not going to court. So the ones that we write here in the town have been going to court. And to my knowledge, I haven't gotten any feedback from uh, Officer Burnett that um, he's been having problems in the uh, in the courts with convictions. Okay. So it's nothing that actually being dismissed and not going to court. No, okay. not 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 citations in the town. Now I think once once we get into once we transition into this new work schedule and we start doing a, a lot more of our educational and enforcement type activities, it would probably give me a better opportunity to be able to gauge exactly what's going on with the citations that are happening here in the county. I, I'm not sure that I have enough data right now to be able to give you a definitive answer to say that our convictions are being tossed out or overturned in the courts, um, but I am confident that the officers would let me know if that has been happening and I haven't gotten a key back. Okay. Any other questions for the chief? Yeah. All right. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Stick around for the budget part. Could be helpful. Yes, uh, chamber had a board meeting on the second of March, and uh, a couple of things came up. One was that uh, it seems there are some business owners, and and I don't have any. I don't have any hard evidence on this, but there may, let's put it this way, there may be some business owners in town who are living in their businesses when they do not have a right to do that. Uh, across the street where Mr. Holt lives, uh, we pass a special use permit, so that could be used as a business as well as a residence. He's, he's fine, but uh, word is that there are a few other business owners in town, so I brought that up to the planning commission and it's probably more of a zoning thing, but we're starting to, uh, we're gonna to try to figure out a way to find out if there are actually business owners living in the businesses when they don't have really permission to do that. Okay. We also talked about uh, uh, how you don't have to be a business owner to be a member of the chamber. So the chamber, since we don't have a spouse monthly anymore, the chamber has, is placing an ad or have already placed an ad in the rural Virginia inviting the general public to join the chamber if they'd like. Um, this is a means of supporting the chamber. We talked about uh, residential development and the chamber felt like uh, residential development was important, that it uh, kept communities vibrant, we kept the businesses solvent and successful. And so they support, uh, the chamber supports uh, plan development in the residential area. And that was pretty much took up most, most of the hour and a half we were meeting on so that Wednesday morning. Any questions? We'll ask Mr. Bullock what's going on with ARB. Yeah, two major things from our last meeting. We approved our um, inventory for this year. The good news is that last year, I think there's 17 or 19 properties rated poor, meaning unsealed or structural issues. And this year we had 11. Um, mm -hmm. A couple of those were changed the, thanks to our architect who's now on the board, sort of taking a closer look at some of them, sort of being able to better assess their condition. So I think two of them came off the list for that. But the others uh, came off because property owners did maintenance this year, which was good to see, whether it's sealing up windows or shoring up structural issues. But that was really, really good to see. And all of it above board, because all of it was replacing in time sort of thing, um, a fairly simple picture. So that was really nice to see. And some other properties went from like fair to good. We don't talk about those here because there's nothing legally binding about those statuses. Um, but it was nice to see people taking care of their homes and it was encouraging on our, on our inventory. So. Uh, we approved that inventory for this year. Those um, properties rated poor will receive a notice from the town, as always. They have 90 or 60 days to meet with us mm -hmm. to come to the plan of action for the year to start moving forward to make progress to remediate the problem within the calendar year. So um, as long as they're making progress, we're satisfied. So that's the idea. Mm -hmm. um, the other, the, the majority of our meeting, though, is spent meeting with Tiger Fuel. This is our second meeting now with Tiger Fuel about their site plan. 
Um, I think it was a really productive meeting. I feel pretty positive coming out of the direction we're heading with it. We've proved nothing so far. Um, we're really just getting a sense for the site and um, the entrance corridor and trees, which is our purview as a board and our interest in the town. Um, so where we started with that was the site plan itself. When we rezoned the whole lot commercial, they wanted to move their overall site 32 feet closer to 20. And so and they were pretty adamant about that um, for um, using additional portions of the commercial lot for generating revenue. Um, they're also concerned about visibility and safety for their second. Um, and so with that in mind, we sort of went back and forth, like why move it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but they're pretty adamant that not moving that site would be a sort of a hindrance to the profitability of the location. So I don't know. Um, but that's what they said. Um, and so what we were talking about, and I'm very grateful that Aaron Root on our board, who is a landscape architect and knows a great deal about trees and plantings and um, design. Um, she spoke very elegantly and eloquently about the trees and, and what we can do. And so we, we had a good back and forth about the entrance corridor. And so what happened today, um, Aaron walked the site with Bartlett Trees and Tiger Fuel to take a look at the trees, A, to identify ones that we can save, um, because where Tiger Fuel was willing to work with the town was uh, doing some creative landscaping around that corner, which they usually don't do, and they said as much, um, but they're willing to work with the town on that. And so I visited the site with Aaron last weekend, and what I discovered is that the Google Maps view is a little, um, misleading in a way the corner is not quite as large as the picture makes it seem from the street view and basically there are two stands of trees there's a driveway running parallel to 20 that you really can't see here there are two stands of trees there there's one stand of tree which i'll call the 20 stand because it's right on 20 and then there's another tree which i'll call the interior stand because it's interior to the driveway those interior trees will probably not survive regardless of where the site goes just because of the amount of excavation that has to happen for the parking lot in general plus the disruption of root systems mm -hmm. so those are those are probably not going to make it what i'm particularly interested in and what aaron was interested in and i'll have more feedback for you next month is that the stand along 20 remains preserved mm -hmm. because there are some mature trees there that are pretty far from their actual site that will likely not necessarily, that may not need to be disrupted. Um, the other thing that Aaron and I discussed were the trees right on the corner, because there's some mature trees there. And where the driveway is, is kind of an organic place to put signage, because they're gonna wanna put a sign out there on the corner. Um, and what I'm interested in seeing is how they can work with the existing canopy and trees there, just to sort of integrate it with the site. And I think, so anyway, that's what I'm interested in getting feedback about, because. Um, because it's smaller than it looks like on the picture, and therefore I feel like kind of workable. Mm -hmm. And I was, um, anyway, I was grateful that they were willing to work with us on sort of evaluating trees that are worth keeping. Some of them are standing too close together for like longevity, et cetera. Um, and the other additional piece in terms of new planting, because if they end up taking the trees down along James River Road here, um, which I don't know if they need to or not, that was another question I had, because they're gonna have to have some burn there between the parking lot and the street. I don't know. And I don't know. Other questions. Lifespan of these pine trees. Some of them may be very old anyway. Um, so that's that's why we had Bartlett Tree Service out there to evaluate. Point is, the new plantings, um, we got them to agree to do a higher cal caliper planting, meaning that the trees will already be more mature and more established. So it'll be bigger trees. So we won't be dealing with like the uh, Wegman's parking lot, which is those of you who drive by that a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. The, the trees have been growing for five years, and I think some of them now survive to four feet tall. Yeah. And so we won't have that situation here because they're willing to come in with more established trees, both with where they need to cut things down to replant or to do infill. Because even in that stand of trees along 20, there, there are some gaps. And so they're interested or supportive of doing new plantings to fill in some of the gaps yeah it's hard to see those gaps with that other it is Walk, thing, walking guess, the but... site was very very helpful um so that's where we are did um, any of it seems spiteful does it did, 
their willingness to do all this is a contingent on moving that building closer to the road? Do you think I don't one think, would affect the other? I don't think so. Okay. I don't think so. They, they seem to be willing to be collaborative here. They made their interests known very clearly. We also made ours known very clearly. Um, Aaron spoke very eloquently about also carbon dioxide emissions. Um, as a company, their goal is to reduce their own carbon dioxide emissions by 40% over the next 15 years or something like that. And Aaron said, well, the number one way to do that is trees. And so, you know, um, so I, I think we made a really good case and I think they heard the importance of it. And I think we're in a position now to do something a little more creative with their site, even than they've attempted in others, um, which I think will be good both for them and us um, if they're able to do it. So that's where we are. We don't have anything approved yet. Um, the overall site plan, we got a good explanation just for the logic of the flow around there, dealing with semi trucks and tankers and visibility of tanks by cashiers and safety that was helpful for us to hear because originally, I was like, well, let's change the whole thing and put the tanks behind. For that. And I, I think they made a clear and sound um, judge or ra ra rationale about why things are the way they are. Um, so, really, for us, I think the uh, our main focus going into our April work session will be site design around plantings, that entrance corridor and signage. Um, and so approved nothing so far, but I think we're in a healthy dialogue. And I was pleased to get out there myself with Aaron and that they were all willing to get down and to bring in an outside tree expert too to, to take a look at things. So I don't know if you have any questions for me, other questions for me about that at this point. Questions, anything else? Well, and that's it. That was our that was our meeting. Those are the two big things. So that's how your conversation took up a, a good deal of our time. So. Well, we appreciate your hard work, but this is uh, important that we get this business up and going mm -hmm. up there. Uh Vice Mayor Grisco Planning Commission. I know you were in attendance. Yes, there were two notable things worth mentioning. One is there is a couple of properties we talked about last meeting that we had a discussion about uh, this past week, 474 Valley Street and 496 Valley Street. 474 is a building that will have office space and also two Airbnbs. We also talked about for 96, which I'm sorry, 474, which is the old building that we talked about before, which is in the back, the building that would be an Airbnb. And it's very interesting, unique building. And we talked about that we also did a public hearing on it. So the next step for this, we recommended it come to the town council. So that would come to us uh, here. Matt, will we, would that be something we would do next week or would we do that next month? Uh -huh. The next town council action is to call the public hearing, which means a month of notice. Okay. To set that up and have a decision on the matter for the And then we also had a interesting conversation on some work that Matt had done, which I think Matt we're talking about here tonight too, right? Certainly can. Well, I mean, it's not it's not a new topic related to high school. Is that or am I thinking something? That, that's true, Matt. Yes. Um, so we talked about planned unit development at the up the high slung property, and that introduced us to a number of different ways to look at it. Basically, because it has the possibility for a different set of mixes, if you zone it one way, you're you know, whether it's residential or whether you zone it for businesses, this would be a mix of things. It's often that these kind of buildings and the way that they're used in other areas have a a number of different mixes. So that's something that I think is on our agenda for tonight also as we started to look at that. So a conversation was started this last week and it's gonna take a month or two as we talk through these various options. Mr. Mayor. Uh, any questions for Dan? Hey, the treasurer's report.
Um, we have a little bit more discussion later in the agenda about um, budget recommendations for next year, um, but I can share now a little bit on current accounting. Um, Mr. Avellis has a financial report um, here in hard copy for you. Um, I draw your attention to a couple of points on it. Um, the first is the major change in cash balances. Um, you see the top line on that front page is the cash balance in the general fund, very much stronger than it was at the same time last year. Um, that's the effect of the American Rescue Plan on our liquidity. Um, this is often the point in the year where our cash balances are lowest. Historically, that's been a problem of, of watching how much money is in the bank at this point in the year. And the, um, the Rescue Plan funds came in in July and gave us an operating cushion. Um, which I think we can expect to see through um, the next couple of years. Unless town spending changes in a, in a big way, sort of the new floor of where our checking account balance sits is $200,000, where in past years it might have dropped as low as fifty dollars or $30,000, which creates a little bit of anxiety about making payroll. Mm -hmm. um, not having to worry about that anymore is a big change. And, and from the treasurer's perspective, takes a lot of heartburn out of month-to-month -month operations. Um, so it puts us in a strong position to make plans for bigger projects for the, for the future. Um, I can point out a couple of revenue lines and spending lines that inform the budget conversation later on. Um, the town is in a positive cash flow position for the year to date. And like I said, that's not always the case at this point in the year because some of the biggest tax revenues have not arrived yet. So that pressure of paying utility bills every month, makes payroll every month, sort of builds up. And the town historically has run a deficit up until about March, and then at the end of the year, between April and June, we get it. Um, that's not the case in the current year. So that's for the same reason I mentioned. The town for the year to date has earned more revenue than the investment. So that cash flow continues to get stronger. That is. Um, and so that, that difference shows on page four that the total income for the year is more than the total spending for the year. And, and in February, that's historically has not been the case. But the good news. Um, page five shows um, income summaries by category. And I might point your attention to the sales tax line. Um, we're two thirds of the way through the year, eight months out of 12. So for the sources that come in pretty steady every month, you might expect us to be at 66%. One of the straightforward ways of reading this is looking at that percent of budget target and comparing those numbers to a target number uh, 66. Sales tax, right on track, 65 and three quarters percent. Um, you've seen good news about retail spending. Um, if anything, inflation begins to be a concern now. That helps the town better. If something costs twelve dollars instead of ten dollars, our um, sales tax income increases, um, and we, we just hope that what we pay is not being six percent. Um, meal tax sixty nine percent. It's a little bit ahead, but right on right on target. That's our single biggest revenue line that the town controls, so that's good. Cigarette tax sixty five percent. That's right on track. Transient occupancy tax up above. 115% for the year. So some of that Airbnb taxation question, that's doing well. And there are still a couple that we're checking on, enforcement on, making sure the license is present. But the ones we have are paying for. Um, over on our spending side, um, on the whole, the town is um, below target. Again, 66% of the way through the year, our total spending is 62. So we're on track. Yet. That does vary by department. A couple of departments have had unexpected projects, unexpected expenses. Those will need adjustments in the budget. Um, but others, including the biggest one, police department, only at 60% of their spending for the year. Um, the major savings of that comes from um, position vacancy, having lack salaries. So all of the project improvements that Mr. Jenkins was describing, upgrading a new vehicle, upgrading technology, he was able to do that within the last salaries and, and not have a budget problem. So we can talk more later in the agenda about the kind of search changes that might make sense in these departments. So have any questions um, 
the way to, to get it able keeping and working scan that. Where are we uh, with the business license uh, fee? Can we good, up on those? good question, sir. Um, that shows on page five of okay. this report, right about halfway down. Oh, right. Our target is $85,000, and we have just under 55000 of that earned. Those business license payments were all due on March 1st. Um, most of them came in on time, and so we're going to start the late license enforcement on those now. They accrue penalties every month. Um, we have never gone so far in enforcement that we shut a business down. Um, we'll set up payment plans if a business is in a bad way and um, collect what we need there. But the largest ones are in. Um, you, you know in your mind which of the businesses are the, are the biggest and have the largest annual turnover. Those can be ten, twenty thousand dollar checks coming in, and when they come in on time, it really helps. Mm -hmm. So those are the, the big ones. Okay, thank you. And just a, a something I was thinking about: if a, an individual works from home, mm -hmm. are they required to file for a business license to pay that tax? It depends a little bit what kind of work it is. Um, if I'm um, uh, an engineer and I work for a big company out of Richmond, but I have my blueprints with me, I can do my work from home and I'm not commuting to Richmond anymore. The business license is still drawn by my corporate office in Richmond. I'm not an independent contractor, so no business license. If I'm in freelance work, um, photographer, wedding planner, or an independent engineer, and I'm now working from home where I used to maybe have an office somewhere, you do need that business license. That doesn't click. So, so if you're a piano teacher and you're teaching your home, you need a license. But if you make house calls, you wouldn't. Um, good, no, good, good point. The, the house calls are a good example. My the locus of my business is still my house, even if I make those house calls. Okay. My schedule book stays at home. My car is parked at home. You can't dodge a business license by driving around and not saying anything. You have to pick a place where it is. Um, so some of, some of our work in business licenses that outreach a bit of what the mayor mentioned with the Chamber of Commerce. So if somebody is working from home and their hobby has maybe grown into a business during the pandemic and they didn't know about business licenses, this is the kind of home. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I have I have a business license. I work home. I have a separate building that I work in, it's our studio, but I still have a business license. Yeah. Okay. Um, anything else for the no. treasurer at the moment? If not, we'll move on. Mayor's report. Uh, inter interesting couple of weeks. I've met with the chief a couple of times and met our new officer of Wood um, and getting to uh, Councilman Payne's uh, question. Uh, just this afternoon, the chief and I were talking about. Uh, used to be able to write summonses for everything. And now the, the General Assembly seems to, have, you know, think, and you look at it both ways, you see somebody with a, uh, a headlight out, you stop them, you know, you, you, could, you, you have discretion, you could say, uh, you, know, you know, your headlight is out, you know, but you check their license, they might be more warning. Gave you an opportunity to check for warrants and, uh, you know, suspended license, stuff like that. And then the General Assembly says, you know, can't do that anymore right now. Uh, guy with no muffler on the car, just have to let him go. Hmm. You know, stuff like that. What they consider minor infractions. Hmm. But sometimes minor infractions will, will lead a police officer to be able to apprehend somebody that he's been looking for. Hmm. Okay. So that's kind of, I'm sure that has played in a little bit to a uh, number of summonses that have not been written in the last. <laughs> Six or eight months. Mentioned the board meeting. Um, Matt and I had an interesting meeting the other day with a U Haul it representatives, uh, marketing company president for U Haul Company of Richmond, Mr. O'Neill, and uh, Tamara Adler, the area field manager. Uh, U Haul has a, a program where they partner with local businesses. If you have a uh, a forest shop and you want to offer U-Haul vehicles for a uh, lease, uh, 
you can get into a partnership with uh, View Hall, and they will park a couple of uh, vans, not the great big moving stuff, but just regular like small vans, for, uh, like an Nakata Live or something like that. A couple of them outside your business, and you can you can lease those things. Problem is the uh, the business that contacted View Hall it from here in town uh, is in historic district, so he can't have rental trucks parked outside his mm -hmm. business to lease. He has to, he has to do something. But they gave a nice presentation. It was a little over an hour and they answered some questions. I didn't know they had this program. They don't put big, uh, you know, 20 trucks out on a big lot and try to sell them. But not, they don't want to construct anything. They just want to mm -hmm. offer a partnership with existing businesses that are that meet the criteria for being a, <laughs> a representative of U-Haul. So, we sent them back to talk to the, the guy that contacted them and uh, see what they can work out. <laughs> and then that afternoon, we had a um, meeting with Supervisor Price to go over the previous uh, day's uh, board of supervisors meeting. And it was not a whole lot of uh, exciting things at that meeting, except uh, they have kind of, they had three uh, proposals for redistricting uh, based on population. And seems like most all the supervisors um, are in favor of one version of the rezoning, which gives actually gives the Scottsdale district uh, a few more residents. So, uh, you know, Crozet's from the Monkey Ridge and everything because they've got more and they need to, you know, need to balance this thing out. So, we just that was the main topic of discussion. And I mentioned about the planning commission meeting and, uh, that was pretty much it, but I did want to mention to you that uh, this coming Wednesday at eight o'clock, if you're up and about and you want to go down to Hatton Ferry, the ferry is going to be lifted out of the river and brought up on shore so they can do an examination, see what needs to be done to fix this thing, to put it back into operation. So that's at eight o'clock on Wednesday morning. And, and if there's nothing seriously wrong with it, it could be back in service pretty soon. Right? You're hoping to get it back in by April, something yeah. in the latter part of April. But uh, is anybody going to be filming it? Uh, I don't know. I, a, I think it will be a media event. They just yeah, did a uh, the historical society yeah. guy, Tom, uh, will be there. And uh, the Wright family was kind enough. Uh, I went up. I told you last month I went to the uh, on the eighth of February went to the uh, historical society where the uh, the Wright family uh, with a lot of connections around here who now live in South Carolina gave the uh, historical society twenty five thousand dollars to get the Hatton Ferry going again. So it's uh, putting their money to use. Uh, Mr. Bowling, got anything for us? Um, I was going to talk about the uh, florist with the U-Haul business, but she stole my thunder, Mayor. Okay, go right ahead. I was happy to see that work out, but it gave me an opportunity to go over with Matt uh, uh, what you needed to do as a, as a zoning administrator to report a violation. And uh, uh, essentially, it's a dot your I's, cross your T's exercise. But when, when Matt, as zoning administrator, makes a decision, the applicants, the violator, alleged violator, is going to have a right to appeal the decision to the Board of Zoning Appeals if, if that appeal is made within 30 days. Uh, there are some emergency uh, uh, methods that Matt can take if you really have an ag egregious violation. Uh, um, it sounds like from talking to Matt that you were able to work everything out. You, I, Matt, did you get the um, motion for the signatories of documents on the agenda tonight? Um, the that signatory resolution, sir? Yes. Um, I can grab it real quick, but do you, you want to go over that issue, please? Yeah, just very quickly. Um, uh, you, 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 you meet for a lot of different things, and often you, you uh, have agreements that come before you and you sign them, which are really sometimes the actual effect of those things is, is in the future. And, um, and often, too, I've noticed that the, uh, uh, there's no particular person designated to sign the agreement. Uh, in lieu of, of no designation, my opinion is that the mayor as the chief executive officer of the town has that authority. But um, I told Matt, the council may want to consider uh, passing a motion uh, by which it designates the 
the uh, town administrator or the mayor as the, as the signer of any documents if the town council does it designate at the time the motion is passed who's to sign the document and it, put it to record and then you've got it in the future if you need it. It, it was an interesting bit of trivia with things like um, grant agreements and contracts. It was the first time I had come across this, but the, the agency's attorney coming back and looking at my signature and saying, are you are you sure you're the right person to be signing this? Um, because council's vote doesn't tell me to do it. It just says the town does this thing. So checking on that authority actually is important <coughs> that um, you don't have staff signing for things when they're not entitled to do so. Mm -hmm. Who really should be signing for your contract? And if you mm -hmm. don't say that, then it's potentially something to be challenged. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What, what kind of contract are we talking about? This was um, a VDOT contract. That, yeah, uh, this, this was some of the VDOT papers. Okay. And, and we signed things like purchase orders all the time. Right. Um, so I, I was it surprised me because um, I, I hadn't had that come up before. I, you know, on, on what authority do I sign this thing that council said they want? Mm -hmm. I had to shoot Matt down, but uh, I think the mayor trumps Matt in the, in the town charter. That was my thinking for better or worse. Um, lastly, I. I Greg has been uh, funneling by me all these policies that he's been uh, um, working on, and I'm, I'm, I'm impressed at what he's doing. Uh, I think, I mean, he's really making things ship shape. Um, there's a lot of work, but I am impressed at the effort that he's making. And, and lastly, I, I won't say anything. I think the audit's later on in the agenda, but I see the audit at last is up to date. And uh, over the years, the town has had some difficulty in, uh, having audits regularly approved uh, on, a, on, a, on an annual basis. So uh, Matt and then his staff are to be congratulated on that. Anybody else that help with that venture? That's all I have, Mayor. Well, thank you, Mr. Bowling. Any questions for Mr. Bowling? Yeah. Well, if any you, anything else to... One last thing. If any of you have any questions, always feel free to call me up. You know, just give me a call and, I, and I'll... Uh, do my best to try to answer your question. We appreciate Thank that. Thank you. Do you have anything else to add as the town administrator right now, or we'll oh. move on to the uh, budget thing? We have a little bit of um, emergency management follow-up um, from our from our winter storms and flood control work. Um, Chief Jenkins mentioned the flood control exercise coming up. I took a tour of town um, last week with the newly appointed. Um, 911 center director who does regional emergency management, Mr. Simon Sexton, um, got to show him the works on our flood control system and stress the importance of that. Um, we also still have storm cleanup and volunteer work going on. So if I can, I'd like to give the floor briefly to Jack um, so we have Maxwell to, just, to describe some of the organizing work he can do. In so we're at 99% complete on the bank face nature area. We saw this monster tree meet. We still have not been able to locate right at Stumptown. Fence entrance. We don't know if it's been cleaned up. We, we, we went out there the other day and couldn't find it. Hmm. So we're calling, classifying it as 100% cleaned up. Okay. Now, we guess your guys' choice if you want to do mulch debris. Hmm. If farm marshal for Armour County Progress says we cannot do a control burn yeah. or a burn it. Yeah. It's like three stories high. So it's something you guys, what you guys can do with it. Also, they, um, as he says, there's a, we're working on, the county's working on a regional emergency management person, um, Marble. Who was a previous one left to go to state mm -hmm. as an incident management person. Right. And now we're and also the presidential declaration of emergency has been declared for state for Elmore County. So I guess you guys can try and get some funding mm -hmm. to or um that's not classified as trees, mm -hmm. but if you can work with try to get funding for that. Um, also we're working with um police chief on some activities for a task force. Right now we're first our heads right now about if you do want to cert or not, mm -hmm. but right now we're going towards a task force which gives us more regional Motor aid requests with Fayette County, Buckingham, and Nelson, which which a cert team is only for local net region. So we're getting towards a task force for all the rest of the activities that we need to do. Mm -hmm. Thank you, sir. Okay, thank you for all your work, guys. Yeah. Appreciate all you guys. Sure questions. So I think I'm the chief over here. Okay. Thanks. Jack, you have a question? Yes. When we were up there last, um, going up the trail into Van Cleef, just past the dam, the spillway. Yes. There's a lot of trees down. Uh, we need somebody with pole saw. I guess. So, question. 
Yeah, so is that still up there and do we need we need to still clean it? I guess that out, I gotta right? reach up to him see if it's a female issue first before we move. I, I know it is. Yeah. There's, there's still yeah. 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 Do you have any plans for doing that? The... It's the it's the lowest priority from the from the roads to the trails. It's on now. Um, okay. Which I want to okay. Do. So is that there's no danger of that backing up water or anything? There is potential. There's a few trees up behind some of the buildings yeah. along the hill. That's on my main concern. That if it falls, yeah. it will crash to a building. It can also fall the, for inland flooding yeah. inside the town. So wow. somebody needs to climb up there and like remove the tree. Hmm. Yeah, full in. Okay. Hmm. You know what? Do you know anybody with a chainsaw? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> also, you will need somebody with big holes to come out and do it. Yeah, you said we need to make a decision or the town needs to make a decision about what we'll do with it. I mean, up there, it's kind of like a nice pine hallway. Yeah, like, it kind of is, yeah. When you're walking, you know, but small thing sounds good to me. I don't know what the other option would be up there. That's you can haul about. the wood down and give it away as far as the wood. You can burn it. That's the only yeah. issue. That smoke's like crazy. Pine, yeah. yeah. Could yeah. you make it accessible to people to use for mulch? You can only use for mulch. So oh, like, could the town make it accessible to people in the town if you want to mulch stuff? Carrying would be hard. The easiest yeah. thing would be to chip it on site and put it on trips. Okay. Oh, yeah, that works. Yeah. Can we get a chipper to come down? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah. Okay. That sounds cool. I try and look for one and try and right get on. cool. Yeah. 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 Trail. Yeah. Trail best. Yeah. Yeah. Anything else you guys yeah. have? Any other questions? Sweet. I know that, like you said, Mark, we're going to try and do this flood protection thing. I've been sending out traffic alerts, auto posting now. And um, so basically, we've been working on graphics for put out over Facebook for alerts, make more like more perfect. And so I'm work with um, whoever's with Chief on more stuff that we can post out. Right now, we have an automated weather alert system that posted. Mm -hmm. Working with Tim Carr, adding a weather camera down here for local media to use, mm -hmm. and try to put it on a flood public you know, now for mm -hmm. flood protection. Great. Great, Jack. You do a good Thanks. job. Anything else? We appreciate it. Is that everything I could That's great, sir. Thank All you. I'm going. Thank you, sir. Thank Thanks. You, okay. Anything else, Matt, before we move into new topics? That's good, sir. Thank you. All right. Recommended budget presentation. The floor is yours. I go through a little bit of this um, narrative. This, this document will be my guide for this evening to start our budget conversation. Um, this is a um, it's an annual routine of the councils um, preparing budgets for fiscal years that start on July first. Um, if you if you watch some of the headlines in um, the paper, you'll see the state working to the same calendar. Um, they missed one of their first deadlines on Friday on their budget. So they're in um, extra innings to get their $100 billion budget ready for July 1st. Um, Charlotte <coughs> City and Avonmore County, um, working with $200, $300 million budgets, have their drafts presented um, and are beginning their um, public hearings about um, tax rates and category spending. When they have $75 million school projects. Those are kind of more complicated debates. Our process is a, a little bit simpler with um, budgets that have ranged over the years on either side of $1 million. Smaller if we're not taking on big special projects, larger if we are. Um, historically, the biggest budgets the town ever adopted were um, streetscape when we were passing that heat out. Money. Those made for big budgets to require extra money. Um, so here at this point, this is the staff recommendation of um, you know first draft um, what we what we think is necessary to meet town council's goals for the upcoming year starting in July first. I also include on this document a supplemental appropriation to square up um, the year that we're in now. Like I said back in the treasurer's report, there are a few categories where we've achieved some savings, but a couple of other categories with um, unexpected expenses. And the town um, needs, to, needs to be working on a balanced budget. So the supplemental is what gets that square. Um, so that speaks to the process um, with a, a staff draft first, 
And then uh, council can respond to that with some other work sessions, give us some guidance on what needs to be bigger or smaller projects that we want to achieve that we don't see here. Or if um, if a number seems too high, um, our pitch is lower and we'll figure out how to do that. Um, you advertise a public hearing on a maximum budget and tax rates, um, ideally in um, April or May. That's an important kind of threshold, a little bit like the prices, right? Where what town council advertises sets a ceiling that what you end up voting on can't be any more than that to spend and can't be any more than that on tax rates. You still have the ability to negotiate down. Um, and adopt something smaller, but what you advertise has to be the ceiling, and under no circumstances can we go higher than that. Um, and then um, the target for adoption um, is, is May or, if necessary, June. We have some bookkeeping work to do to set up the new budget, so a May adoption is our preferred target so that the town clerk and the town auditor kind of get ready and reset the bookkeeping before we hit that New Year day on July 1st. Um, Government Services Committee has met a couple of times on some of these topics to kind of get ready for this presentation. Um, so my thanks to Mr. Payne um, and Scott Real and Kevin Quick on that committee talking through some of these issues with us. With um, changing news, the last paragraph I wrote in this document was the economic risk one. Um, risk, of, risk of recession, oil price shock, inflation fears, um, it seems like you know coming out of pandemic budgets and going into war budgets is um, distressing. Um, so we we try to build some slack into these, understanding that if revenues go south and we need to cut back, that we have a plan of how we're going to do that. Um, so this document that was presented in February of 2020 included that recession scenario. I didn't know what was going to cause it, but I said. Something happens that causes maybe a bank or a couple of restaurants to close. This is what we're going to do. Um, and how we responded to that. And then, the pandemic, when we needed to make scenarios and make cuts, we were ready to do that. Mm -hmm. So that still feels like the responsible way to approach this. Um, I then go to kind of the, the important bottom line on this, which is tax rates and our revenue. Um, we have a structural problem in our budget. And uh, town council has addressed this some in the past, and the, the problem in the news continues. Government services took a hard look at it. Um, and I think the best way I can explain this is the, the graph on the second page. We have four local revenues that make up, in a light year, when we're not doing a lot of grant work, the majority of our budget meals tax, business license, bank franchise, and cigarette tax. Those are fifty to eighty thousand dollars tools each, and in total they provide the core of our budget. Um, look at the the peak of that column where it was in twenty seventeen, and the peak of that column of where it is in twenty twenty three forecasts. They're right about the same. We've had our ups and downs as restaurants do better or worse as. Um, Banks do better or worse. Some businesses open, some close. But this trend line is not up. Um, at the same time, town operations have expanded, um, moving a police department towards accreditation. Um, we've got increased costs on benefits and pensions. Um, many of our costs of doing business are up, and our core revenues are not. And so that requires us to at least look at tax rates. There was some discussion last year about town real estate tax. Um, Tom Unsworth did a great research project on this. Most Virginia towns use a local real estate tax on top of their town in the neighborhood of 10, 20, 30 cents. And that's what you see in Amherst, Gordonsville, Louisa, Madison, all of our peers. Um, the town does. Um, local businesses and outside shoppers, folks who don't live in town, come and patronize their businesses, they're the ones who provide these business license revenues and these no tax revenues. Um, cigarette tax, transient lodging, all the same. For that reason, um, the town not having leaned on real estate in, in the past, and since we have 
this outside traffic coming in, tourism, and people who do not live here paying town taxes. My recommendation is to increase those rates. We have the legal authority to move our meals tax and our franchise tax to tax higher. Admiral County is, re is recommending exactly that. So my recommendation is to match Admiral County's advertised rate increases. So a restaurant on this side of the town line will have the same tax as one located elsewhere in Admiral. Now, Buckingham and Fluvanna don't have no meal taxes at all. Fluvanna put that up through a referendum a couple of years ago and failed. For that reason, Fluvanna has a higher real estate rate than Admiral does. They're using um, real estate tax to pay for their new high school. Admiral was looking at some school projects too, and they're proposing meal tax. I think we should do the same thing. Mm -hmm. Um, the effect of that increased forecast and gets this trending up significantly. It's about $60,000 of forecast new revenue. Depending on how the assessments come in, it would take eight to 12 cents of your revenue to achieve the same thing. Mm -hmm. okay. um, and considering the needs and costs and you know what, what tax lever is easiest to pull, mm -hmm. no one likes to pull it. But I think the meal tax is, is preferable to the real estate tax at this time. Hmm. Hmm. What is it now? Five percent? Four and a half. Four and a half. Um, we, we did a rate increase um, pre pandemic, um, advertised a 1% increase mm -hmm. and adopted half. So we went from four to four. Um, so, kind of the same question like, okay, all well, of this rescue plan money is coming in, why do we need to? The question of, you know, is, is this budget greedy or is this budget hasty? Um, we have specific plans on what we're using our rescue plan on for. Those are good project goals, um, but they don't run forever. We have some good flexibility in that. Government Services Committee spoke, spoke very well to me about not running on a sugar line. That if, if we have this problem, if these base revenues are not trending up, it would be kicking the can down the road to just burn our rescue plan money until 2024. And then facing an embedded problem. Mm -hmm. so what we're allowed to do with our rescue plan funds is ease this in, build up our reserves, get some good project work done, help the police department get accredited, help the DMV get on its feet, um, make up for lost time on capital like flood control and parks. And then when that rescue plan money is over in 24, we'll be on firm footing and able to take care of the mm -hmm. um, But I it feels wiser to make this recommendation to you now than to face a bigger problem in three years. Two clarifying questions. Please. One is, and I guess it's bigger, why do you not recommend a real estate tax at this time? I, I feel a trade off between who pays and how steady is the revenue. In this time, 2020, I wouldn't have guessed that any event could have closed all the restaurants at the same time. Meal tax is shaky. Restaurants close, our payment goes down. It's already seasonal, unreliable. A couple of restaurants having good that once, and we see that. On the other hand, our meal tax is paid by 15,000 people. Real estate tax is paid by 300 property owners. So the real estate tax also has a shaky base. Assessments go down, properties run into decline. Real estate tax is more solid, but it's it's a, it's very much a judgment call for council of how do you want to spread that load? Um, who do you want to pay? One of the things I try to match up, two things, two things from, from finance class. Um, one is how administratively easy is it to do the tax? How leaky is the bucket? How much time do we waste collecting something that's difficult? We already have no accounts. The routine is set. 95% of our payments are on time, no problem. They don't have fraud issues. We don't fight over the assessments. It's easy to collect. Changing the rate, no problem. Equally easy to collect. So it's administratively simple. We start real estate tax, there will be some very complicated discussions with both that tomorrow and Savannah. About how they're going to start building for us because they, they haven't done that since the 90s. Mm -hmm. um, so, which is easier for staff to start? You know, tax is easier for, that, for staff to start. Um, the, the downside, though, is real estate tax is guaranteed revenue. Mm -hmm. Property values may go up and down, but they do not go to zero. Mm -hmm. Meals tax, they can't all close. It's shaky and risky. 
So some of the recommendations we made last year about like, okay, what would it mean to add a real estate tax to the town revenue base? That's all still true. Um, that's the kind of rock solid income that you can go to the bank and borrow from. Um, there's a very good reason that counties finance schools with real estate tax revenue because it's reliable and it's not usually affected by recession as much as some of these other business ones. So which is, you know, which is more of a house built upon sand? I'm not sure. They they both have their risks. Mm -hmm. Other questions for Matt? Oh, this is just a simple one. Where is the DMV select revenue on in the budget? Thank oh, there you. it is. Under DMV select. <laughs> <laughs> they've, they've got their category spending. Yep. That shows you their line in detail. DMV revenue shows up on the back of the first page as a revenue line. Mm -hmm. It comes as state revenue um, because the check comes to us from the state treasury as they pay us back. Okay. Um, it's DMV Select Services, second page uh, near the top. Um, okay. Cover page. Oh, back of the page. Oh, you're looking at the whole packet back. Put that packet in. Dang it. Oh, okay. There oh, there we go. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, our target for this year was an assumption that DMV would pay its way it. to the tune of about three quarters. It has not done right. that. Okay. It has not done that. I think realistically we're at twenty thousand dollars of revenue mm -hmm. here in the first year, and it's hard right. for me to be more ambitious than to increase that by fifty percent. Got it. Mm -hmm. um, the Charlottesville community select did break even for itself in its second year. I hope we do that. Mm -hmm. And um, tomorrow, actually, our DMV staff are visiting some um, commercial units things like loggers and trucking companies mm. that have a lot of vehicles and make sure that they know to come here for the registration and sales tax and all right. that. Um, so I, I make a very conservative estimate on this. If it pops up to 100,000, that's very good news. Mm -hmm. um, well, I, I have to run this revenue numbers. Are they, are they still appointment only? They are. They are. Do, you, do you see that changing in the future? Or are they gonna stick to what they're doing now? Um, we like it because it manages the workload. Okay. I think if we, but it also limits the workload. Yeah. I think if we open that up, we would earn more revenue, but people would be waiting in line. Mm -hmm. I think it would trade off. There'd be, a, there'd be a few more angry people. Because yeah, line, but our revenue would show better. Mm -hmm. But those ang angry people might go to one of the restaurants to wait while they're waiting. Mm -hmm. Come back in half an hour. Yep. <laughs> Talk to Shepard and okay. Um, Back when we did the other meal stacks adjustment a couple of years ago, I was doing some research uh, on the subject. And I remember that, uh, and this has been for you three or four years ago that uh, Hampton, who has a lot of tourists, has a meal tax back then of 11 and a half cents. Wow. Williamsburg has a lot of tourists. I don't know what their meal tax is, but the real estate tax is way down because the tourists they own. Mm -hmm. so, and to me, let's let visitors pay the tax. I'd rather see the visitors pay the tax than to have the residents pay a real estate tax. Mm -hmm. um, there are a couple of revenue and spending lines that get a little bit more detail that I'd like to, to add on and mention. One is zoning permits. As you've, as you've seen, we've had a fair number of special use permits um, and other applications come before you. Those have application fees on them that have not been increased in 25 years. Um, I I don't assume fee increases on this budget, but I might I might ask your, your guidance on that. Are you willing to consider increases on those fees for plan review? Um, our our applicant with the Tiger Fuel site plan was very pleasantly surprised at what they had to pay because <laughs> doing site plan review in that amount costs a lot more. What's the price difference? What would so what what did we charge for the review that they would? It um, that that blueprint packet came with a sixteen hundred dollar check. The same packet in Nanmar might be double that. Mm -hmm. 
And that's a rounding error on what they're spending too. It's tiny. It is, it is. So point being that we can increase that. It's not going to hurt them. Right? No, I, I, or, I don't think it would make us unfriendly to the business. Yeah. Um, it's just not something the council has looked at in their days. And that, so I think that makes would sense. that also probably be like the time for a COA with the ARB? It could. Uh, okay. It could. That's that's twenty dollars. Right. If you think the staff time from staff and board is more than that, maybe you could do more. Right. Mm -hmm. still be fair. Mm -hmm. You don't want to deter people from taking on projects because of the cost of terms, but right. it maybe should reflect the actual price of the staff work sure. mm -hmm. and, and some recognition of the volunteer time Yeah, mm -hmm. but we'll work for it. <laughs> All right. I mean, it might be worthwhile just to mock it up just to see, mm -hmm. you know, I don't know. Yeah. More information, yep. the better with this kind of stuff. So, um, yeah, I think it, it, it doesn't make sense not to look at it. Yeah. Um, Mr. Jenkins, you said you, you, I, thought, I think you had some thoughts on police budgeting. Um, you talked some about the project work that you've got going on. The, the police department is our largest category of spending almost every year. Um, so maybe that weren't fully the course of what Well, I think for me, Matt, is you know, our biggest expense is the to pay for officers, increase yes. in, in pays for officers. Uh, I know Albemarle County and Lurana County, all of the jurisdictions around us right now, I think except for Buckingham County has, has done an increase for their police staff. Uh, and it's simple math, it's recruiting and retaining police officers. Mm -hmm. I think nationwide, um, hiring and retaining police officers and keeping those that we do hire on board is becoming more and more challenging for departments every day. And I know Albemarle County just increased their, their salaries 11% last year uh, because they had gotten behind so far in salaries. And now this year, they're proposing another 4% increase. Even the smaller jurisdictions and sheriff's offices are paying their officers now starting salaries at about $50,000. That's for a brand new police officer. Right. And I, I, I don't know how we stay competitive um, as a small town um, with salaries. And then we have another big expense with our patrol vehicles. Uh, I, I worry about uh, gas cost and how do we. You know, we can do a lot of patrols, foot patrols uh, in the town, but, you know, it does require gasoline as well. Bicycles looking good. <laughs> I've been exploring the ideas. Uh, but uh, those, are, those are just, you know, when I started here in January, um, looking at our, our fleet of our patrol cars, uh, they've been neglected for a while. Mm. And... Um, I got a call before I got down here that one of them was just unsafe to be on the road and I had to pull it. And that's the vehicle that we just got back from Colonial. Wow. And uh, it's a liability if we, if we don't take those type of things serious. Um, gas, I'm not sure. They're talking six, seven dollars a gallon uh, by the end of the year right. for unleaded fuel. Wow. Um, so, Matt, you're right, bicycles. Yeah, not a bad idea. better all the time. Would it be feasible to get like a gas reserve for a police department, you know, a three or 400 gallon tank that you guys could set aside? Or do you think that's not? I know Albemarle does, and but I don't know how much they set aside. Okay. Uh, I think it, it's dependent. When we had the, uh, the fuel shortage uh, before I left, you know, they had uh, 800 to 1,000, 1,300 uh, 1, gallons of fuel in each one of their fuel sites. I, 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 thought, I thought jurisdictions were able to buy fuel at today's cost this year, at today's cost for the following year. But mm -hmm. I, I think that's what Albemarle was doing or is doing. Uh, that way it doesn't impact them as much. Okay. Um, that would be great. But I don't know if it's something as small as we are that we could participate in. I'm just not mm -hmm. sure. Mm -hmm. This this budget has a four percent overall payroll increase. Um, and it just shows as one line item for all of the salaries. 
so the, the chief can break that up less or more based on uh, merit evaluation. That is the fit. Four percent keeps pace with the market. I hope um, that that we shed in water. Um, we're we're not going to be the highest paid in the region, but, but we want to be somewhere in the middle and uh, good enough for the pension. Yes. And I hope that some of the other benefits of the job here will make it worthwhile. Yeah, uh, that's helpful feedback. Well, the conversation about gasoline also makes me think of diesel for the levy wall pumps, though, as well. So that's they're, they're full now, and I hope it comes down before we need to fill it again. Yeah. Okay. The other question I was looking for our um, part time part time maintenance position. Where does that where is that line? Um, streets. Streets is where that is. Um, Oh, there's a good. Um, thank you. Yep. That that position went to uh, full time mid year here. Um, no, no, full time. Yeah, that's that's consistent with the Harper recommendation that we've had for doing more work on the streets and parks. So we're, we're scoping that um, increase now, now, and we'll see some more attention on spring cleaning, landscaping, and all that. I'm sorry, it's the, it's the top of the final page. Okay. Of the mm -hmm. Got it. And what is the 10,000 for the road bridge trail construction in Grand Creek? Are you looking at capital sir? I'm looking at, I don't have to attend this. I'm looking at um, general fund expenditures. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, yes, and capital improvements just above community development. $10,000. We had set this up for um, exactly that um, improvements in that access access road and trail work. Okay. Um, we have not. Do you have specific projects in mind, or is that just a general flood number? Um, the the Van Cleef improvement that's on the horizon now is at long last that floating dock. Okay. Um, we've made some headway on that discussions with um, the State Department. Uh, Wildlife resources. Uh -huh. I don't. They're they're on commitment to pay for the dock itself. Yeah. I think we're going to have some costs associated with that, okay. improving the access road, oh, really? building an apartment of some kind. Okay. Even if they pay for the whole dock, I doubt we'll get out of that yeah. scot free. Okay. So that's my my fancy um, placeholder. If it's our um, if we think that's the highest priority in the park at this time. Right. Does that make sense? That's yeah, absolutely. And Stuart, just to answer that question too, there's different mm -hmm. directions that we could go. One of the things that we're talking about is trying to follow up with where we've had headway and the actual dock is mm -hmm. something that we were, I mean, it's not an exaggeration to say we were inches away from getting it and it just all fell apart with what the state did with their procurement policies. But, Although there are other ways we could go, that particular one is, I think it makes a lot of sense to go back and work with them. They've told us how to go after it, and, and that's kind of in the process of doing that. Okay. Related to that a little bit, there's also a line here for continuing work on the uh, James River waterfront part. Mm -hmm. um, that's a new line because it's not something the town has invested heavily in in the past. Um, so I look for that to continue um, moving on down with that landscaping plan. So you're thinking that this year, 20,000 to get the, um, the boulders? Um, stone, stone and some bigger trees, and then continue on with, um, with more plants, like, um, maybe larger trees around the grand garden or something. Mm -hmm. Let me raise one other one um, personally. Speaking to the um, vehicle issues, some of that fleet problem, um, Mr. Jenkins mentioned that he was um, he was happy with the F-150 in police service, that there was some good use for that. Um, I personally have a truck that I do not use very much. Um, we are pretty much a one-car household that I'm in, um, and so I am paying on 
insurance and maintenance for a vehicle that I very rarely use. And when I do hop in it, it is largely for work, mm -hmm. um, running, running errands for the town. So I tell my insurance that I get a, a break for occasional work use. Um, but I would be very happy to donate that thing at this point. I would just as soon get it off of my personal insurance uh, bills. Uh, it's an 04 F-150. Um, well maintained by my dad at first and then handed down. I put less than 10,000 miles a year on it now. Um, and uh, I'm very happy to be a one car household and put a time detail on that. And if, uh, if council were interested in accepting that donation, I um, assure you, you would never see that truck in a bar. <laughs> so, thank you, Bob. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Matt. That's very good. That's, yeah, that's, that's really nice. Generous. I think that's that's that'd be great. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you could truck it up to Vancouver for for wood. I have done that. Um, <laughs> so what's that? Other questions. Um, oh. Is it an advantage for the town to have an above ground jet tank and maybe an electric pump like uh, Station 17 has for the emergency vehicles? Hmm. Do, um, do you think we go through enough fuel that uh, we can do a lot more? Is, um, is having something like that, would you go through enough fuel that it wouldn't go bad? How many gallons? Um, I think we would be able to go through that much. Um, Maybe get a little bit better rate on bulk purchase. Yeah, I guess we could take a look. I don't know if we can do a projection. I mean, I've only been here for what close to three months now. Yeah. That pickup truck, you know, I do a lot of walking in the town during the day, though, too. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I go through probably a tank of fuel about every week and a half to two weeks. Patrol officers more. But the patrol officers are definitely going to use mm -hmm. more. Uh, those those Ford SUVs are probably getting about 15 to 17, 18 miles to the gallon at best. Partly because of all the idling. Honestly, I hate to say it because I love Ford, yeah. but I, I just think they're hard on fuel. Yeah. I drove the Dodge Durango for the county and I got 22 miles to the gallon on that car. On a bigger vehicle. On a bigger vehicle, better warranties on the vehicle, the whole mm -hmm. nine yards. That's why we started to switch. Um, I think we could go through 500. Can you yeah. just spin up that way and dive behind the building and see what they've got set up? Up at the fire department? No, at the rescue, rescue station. Okay. Right, it's right in the back parking lot. Mm -hmm. So we used to use it when I was in squad up there. I, I'm pretty sure it's 500 gallon tank with an electric. Pump that's operated from the inside, and the second thing we have to figure out where to put it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I know the fire department has a tank at the fire department because I've gotten fuel there before when I worked with the county. People. They, they have to. You can't just drive a fire engine to the gas station. So, yeah. so I've often thought about: Is there any way to be able to partner with the fire department, the rescue yeah. squad, or something like that, and just yeah. Yeah. Help augment some of the fuel that uh, mm -hmm. that we would go through with the fire department. Maybe we would go through, you know. I think the fire three hundred gallons. I think the fire department at one time was in a partnership with uh, ACFR uh, because they used the same tank that we did. So it's worth looking at. It. Yeah, yeah, it's really going to go up to six or seven dollars a gallon before the end of the year. Buying it now would yeah. We we do well on our diesel. That's um 250, 750 gallons that can come on one delivery, and we pay a bulk rate on that, which is a lot less than what you see in the pump and the pan tax mm -hmm. Um, so if we could go in with bulk purchasing, maybe we could buy it. I can talk with uh, the chiefs at the, at the two departments, the fire department at the rescue squad, and see what their thoughts are. Okay. I don't know what it would entail to maybe make it happen, but it would seem like if we could buy it in bulk and store it, mm -hmm. it would certainly seem to me that it would certainly save the town some money, especially mm -hmm. during times like this. Yeah, yeah. but just look at that, what they got there first, and okay. see if that was something that you all could work with. Okay. Yeah. Um, my my main question at work session as we sort of move this along is about the overall size of the project. 
there are a couple of large grant projects which are up on the next item here. Um, but the if if tax rate changes are absolutely off the table, then I need to rework this mm -hmm. to the to the tune of sixty thousand dollars. I don't think so. Um, um, so okay, so if the tax so that's good to know. So if the tax rates stay the same, you have to find a way to save sixty thousand off this budget somewhere. Yeah, I'm afraid the question is what do you want to not do? Because yeah. I, I think this budget responds to town council's goals and I can't make it balance without that Okay. So yeah. I have a question. Please. At last work session there was a question about um helping boys and girls club. Oh yes. Is that on this budget? It is. It is. I um, it's a it's a new line item because those agency contributions are not things that we've done before. Um, at least not not described that way. So it shows up. It's in the um, community development category, um, and I called it local agency support. Thinking that that might change. Oh, I see. Yep. Okay. I think their request was ten thousand. I have five thousand here. Yeah, they had requested five thousand from the grant, and five thousand from our budget. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the tax rates, in considering increasing them, makes sense. I'm a great believer in who pays the piper gets to pay gets to call tune. And we in the past have been very open-minded about including people from around town in comments about what we do with the town. And I've been okay with that um, because those people have been supporting the town, supporting the town financially by coming in and paying those taxes, taxes on food and, um, and cigarettes. So um, I think since we are giving them um, a say in the town, we should have them help pay for it. I, I don't think tax rates are off the table. I would be, I would be interested in seeing what a, what a real estate tax would look like. I know the uh, the meals tax and transit occupancy keep us competitive or at least comparable with what county governments are, and city governments are doing nearby so we're not at a disadvantage competitively mm -hmm. but i think I, I would still like to see a, a, a picture mm -hmm. of what yeah. that would look like because i know when we increased meals tax last time there's hesitancy about that and yeah um For comparison you know which if, if it has to be this way which would be lovely. yeah yeah so i think that would be helpful too um it's good to know that sixty thousand needs to get cut somewhere from the Expenditures if there is no yeah. increase. So that's helpful information. Yeah. But I would just sort of like to see a fuller yeah. picture of sort of what options are in front of us. Um, also be interested to know what tax rate would what's the minimum tax rate we would have to be to make the extra staffing work. Yeah, I mean, at, at two cents, it's not worth it. Yeah. It's it's the staff time of setting it up is greater than right. Greater than so that's yeah. yeah. So there's no point going into this way. On the so real what estate. Would be, yeah. What's the minimum? Yes. Yes, yes. That would be good to know. One right. of the things I would say is, although I do agree with you, I think it's anything should be on the table. <coughs> I absolutely don't favor doing it, but I do think we need to have a conversation about all the options. You know, mm -hmm. in other words, we need to look and see what different mm -hmm. rates would be for real estate tax, mm -hmm. what different rates would be for meal tax. Mm -hmm. I don't think you would find a great reception in the town. If you, if you think we recently had a problem with what we just had, it would be, I think it'd be much bigger if we went into real estate issues. Mm -hmm. I think it would be a much larger response than we have currently right now. So anyways, I, I, but I think it's fair to talk about it. I think mm -hmm. we should look at the options. We should see what's there. All the different options on the table are just, I mean, we're trying to hash out how to do it. So. Mm -hmm. I think the options and, and, that, and that's a good point of, of what are the options yeah. that um, these these tools are defined in state law. We have a pretty small mother may I list mm -hmm. from Richmond of what we're allowed to tax. Mm -hmm. So for example, we can't do a local income tax. You know, you're you're filing your local taxes, you're paying the feds five thousand dollars, go ahead and pay the town five hundred more. Mm -hmm. You can't you can't do that. In other states, some cities do have that ability. Washington DC City Hall has that. Um, we can't do that. Okay. Um, we can't run our own lottery. 
because Virginia law mm -hmm. raises it. And, uh, my my creativity is pretty well limited by mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Matt. I could just see you running a lottery. I think that would really be you. <laughs> a big ball. Yeah, I, I just can see that in the future. That would be what you know. Thank you a great couple. <laughs> Alamo County gets all the real estate tax. Of these 300,000 in Scottsdale. Yes, at, at, Every penny at, at present you pay 84 and a half cents on Admiral and zero to the town. It could be different. And, and they keep all of that money and they use it for schools and, and planning and the county police and everything else that they do. And there's a, there's a fair debate over how this how the job they're doing is going to be now. But we get none of that real estate money back. Real okay. estate is one of the ones that's allowed to layer on. So if if we did a 10 cent town tax, that would be on top of your 84 and a half. So you're at 94 and a half total. And that's how Virginia towns operate. It's common for there to be a 60 cent county tax and a 20 cent town tax on top. Mm -hmm. um, Lisa is about like that. They're, the county rate is lower than the bad models is, but the town rate puts it up higher. And I think just to, just to clarify, I think just what, what he's saying is the Albemarle 84 cents is going to Albemarle, whatever. Yes. Happens. If we add on to that, it becomes discussion. Mm -hmm. They already have their cut, so to speak. Yeah. We can't change their cut as much as we might like to. Yeah. We're also in an interesting position as a town because we reside in two counties. So, mm -hmm. like, because I'm in Fluvanna, I pay a higher real estate tax than my mm -hmm. Albemarle counterpart. 90. 94 or something like that. Mm -hmm. And so, but our property is set lower. Mm -hmm. So there's a dip, so there's so there's a little difference in like how it all shakes out in terms of like what you're paying every year. But in terms of the tax, the piggyback thing, it will not necessarily land the same on everyone in town just mm -hmm. on which side of the county line you fall on. But uh, I still want to see all the options. It's just how many, yeah, how many how many how many houses are in this event, by the way? Uh, what 30 more it's it's maybe 90 percent 10 percent yeah or right. more yeah still want to see the numbers but mm -hmm. so yeah me too it's an oddity of our situation okay. position yeah um, at what point is the dmv always going to be under expenditures that was not the plan okay um we we presented this last year as a profit center and most of them are on the state law. Um, and we expected it to take some time to get up and running. But is that 112 seems or almost 113? Seems it's a big part of super the high because that it's not something we used to do. And this year it's creating a deficit, um, a drag on the budget that we didn't have. There are 50, 70 of these around the state. Um, and small towns like Madison, um, Remington would not run them if they were money hits. Yeah. Um, we did that research last year and presented it as mm -hmm. a service to the community which would pay its own way. And if it fails to do that, we probably have to look back at it. Yeah. I think maybe make it some people angry. Might be to okay. make it it might be okay. Like it, yeah. to make it not appointment only and yeah. let them line up. Yep. And yep. Let it increase. Yeah. E. W. Thomas, the line that's around the supermarket. Yeah. yeah, and I think which is great. If you're running I love that, and which is great for maybe businesses. <laughs> yeah, they're like, hey, yeah. Yeah. it's going to be at least an hour before we see you. All right, I'm yeah. just going to go get a cup of coffee, or yeah. you know, just yeah. I think operationally that would be a, a good move to consider. Yeah, I think so. And this is exactly the kind of conversation to have. Yeah, based on this situation, what can we do to change our operations? Yeah. Fix a line item that, that we're worried about the cost of the Yeah. Come up with a lot of those kinds of ideas in the next three months. Here. And, yeah. and then we spend a lot of the rest of the year like yeah. Well, sort of cost and then, you know, the construction, et cetera. That's what get us, what, 15000 extra? It did. The carpentry, the electrical, all of that cost more than the cost to build the office. I can't remember the exact figure, but that, that did us in the first year. Mm -hmm. Right. That would happen again. Yeah. Sensibly. Thank you. Sure, sure. Um, so by by all means share share more ideas and your um your action next week um is just to think about it. Um no no votes needed yet. 
looking for a public hearing in May. Um, that's that's okay. Mm -hmm. That's okay. Um, if I can if I can work on the transition from one set of grants to another, um, the uh, the back of the budget package talks a little bit about that, and I'll um, uh, send that into um, the economic development. Um, one of the big changes in our budget, and part of why the current, but why the recommendation for you is going to trigger, is is because of grant funding. Um, 2018, 2019, we weren't doing much of that. Um, in the past, we have street skate being a million dollar project that's spread out over a couple of years. Um, so the back page of this recommendation shows a few of the completed and active grants in the current year, as well as recommendations in the future. And I think that answers pretty well the question of why in the world is this recommendation $1.2 million when the 2018-2019 budget that you voted on was six hundred dollars Well, there's over half a million dollars of new rent money. Um, these are projects that are supported by a comprehensive plan, but also relate to good operations. Working with the agriculture department is the most cost-effective way for us to replace the things here. So I'd be very happy to do one of those every year. Um, and work on a five year replacement cycle for one car per year. Um, those are grants of $45,000 and a really good car loan on the other 15. That's the best way for us to buy a modern police vehicle. Um, we've got a couple of economic development studies moving forward. We can continue our public art partnership with installations and murals. Um, VDOT transportation project was slow getting under contract, but it'll, it, it could go to construction in the next year. As a match payment that goes out. Most of these grants um, on this list actually do not require town match. Um, the worst match rate that we've got is 50 50. Um, some of them are three quarters or 80 20, but there are a couple of um, 50, 80, $100,000 grants on here with no town match. That's very helpful. Um, of course, if the council wants to cut those projects and not do that, it makes the whole budget smaller. But it, it only helps our bottom line if there's a match shown. For example, the um, the project the Department of Conservation to update the floodplains, because of our small town status, they waived the match requirement. And that's a straight award of $123,000 to update floodplains that haven't been changed in 30 years. Mm -hmm. That's good engineering. It's a good project. Um, if the town wanted to back out of it, money wouldn't come in, money wouldn't go out, project wouldn't go down. It doesn't fix our factor problems, right? Um, so I also point to things like um, the solar panel idea. We can use that same agriculture program uh, for that. It's about the same cost as a police car, actually. Um, operate on the same terms. Take away the electric in the future. Um, with the USDA grant, the solar panel will pay themselves back in about four years, where normally you look at like a 15 or 18 year payback on the solar panels. But I think that's a wise investment at this time, and maybe a good example of spending some of your cash on hand now from the rescue plan, mm -hmm. matching it with other grants, and putting us in a position where our electric bill is better for the long term. Yeah, Matt, are these things itemized in our in the budget that you gave us, or do they fall under other? I, I summarize them here because they are scattered all over through the rest of the budget. Okay. So, but some, they're not individual line items? Um, some are. Some okay. Are. Um, so you'll see um, the federal revenue line shows both ARPA and the USDA grants. Um, most of these projects are on capital spending. So you'll see them as police vehicles and equipment, um, victory home improvements. The art grant shows as public art and community development. Um, okay. It's a little bit hard to see where they all fit in the department, so that's why I do the summary page of, okay, how much of this work is right to show us something. Okay. I have a question. Please. So the recommended grants for the 22-23 year yes. would come under like federal and state on here. Right. Are these guaranteed? Like, could we write for these grants and then not get it? Uh, yes. Um, of the ones that you see here, um, the first one, conservation. This one is already a little. Okay. So that's set. 
This one was defined in a formula that Congress passed last year. This one's happening. All the the other ones, seven. Okay. Oh, this one is already under contract. So that's the side of the bottom one. So that's good. The other three, the USDA and the Arts Commission, those are competitive. If we don't get it, then council has the question do we want this so much that we pay for it on our own with no help? Or do we say, yeah, thanks, no thanks. I, I like the solar panels at 15,000, but I don't like it at 60,000. You have that choice. This is also just talking out, just thinking out loud. This is also a place where if we include these grants in the budget and expect to pay 15000 for example, for solar panels, yeah. since the budget is a maximum, we don't have to do it. Right. Right. If we change our minds. Right. And, and don't do it. Well, we can't do it because we can't get the parts. So we can't right. find someone to do the work. Right. But um, so those three are yes. in, in the revenue. Yes. Okay. My, my recommendation is that we do these things. The, the three that aren't guaranteed are in the record. But if we, okay. if we fail to get the grant and we don't do the project, we just have something. Sorry, I could probably do oh, that and that's figure fine. out for myself that it was done. Yep. Um, is, is there any, are there any, you know, strong objections to this grant program? Mm -hmm. No. Yeah. Oops. I didn't know. Yeah. Um, oh, my God. Can I can I carry this over to the, the factory conversation? Because some of some of these grants do tie into some of the economic mm -hmm. yeah. um, It's um it's an important follow-up to um, the special use permit decision that um, that you've got next week and ties in with that comprehensive plan and, and smaller that we um, we did intend in that plan for these projects to move somewhat at the same time. Um, that we're thinking about the whole factory site and the, the hillside on Bird Street is just one piece of the whole thing. So I think this is a um, um, good time to look at the other side of that coin um, and, and get a reminder of how these pieces fit together um, because there's been a lot more attention on the one than the other. But um, Three years ago, that wasn't true. We were talking more about the factory than the hillside. Um, so a few um, progress updates had been made during that time. Uh, um, where does this thing stand? So one part of that is uh, to Mr. Risco's point about planning commission. That um, factory site was the only property in town that is still zoned industrial. Um, historically, all 60 acres of it was zoned industrial. Um, last year, council rezoned the hillside portion to residential, which is what got us that GP application that we have now. We also closed on the conservation easement on that wetland part and rezoned it to full. Mm -hmm. So unless the, the map changes again, there will never be industrial uses in the wetland and there will never be industrial uses on the hillside. We still have that on the grounds of the factory and inside that 150,000 square foot building. Mm -hmm. The building is on heavy industry, which is noisy, smoky, big intrusive stuff. And then the grounds are light industry, which can be smaller machines, storage, and equipment. So the, the routine work that I've been doing since then as a partner with state economic development is to try to recruit another industrial user. Um, and there have been a handful of tours or responses. The way they do this is um, very sneaky code named projects where they don't tell you the name of the firm, but they're a, they're a large manufacturer and they're coming from out of state. They're looking for a site in Virginia and they want 100,000 square feet with a three inch gas line and they want to be as close as they can to an interstate and they need 20 foot ceilings. Do you have a building? And they put out a call all around the state to try to land this business with 100 jobs. Those criteria I said, we got 100,000 square feet, we've got a three inch gas line, we are not close to the interstate, and we have low seasons, 15 feet clear, 18 feet between the rafters. Um, that's a problem. The big forklifts, the Amazon warehouse, a lot of advanced assembly line stuff, they use 30 foot clear ceilings. Um, and this building's obsolete for that. So I've responded to five of these code name projects over the years, and none of them got very far. Um, one 
took our site fairly seriously, but then um, didn't wind up coming to the meeting. So we had a town council closed session about that business. Council said we were interested in maybe pursuing it, but then the business failed to come to say that all the state in Florida. Um, so the feedback that I get from the state government is that the highest on the building is obsolete for new heavens issue. Even if we wanted to get a new tire factory back, today's tire factories don't go to buildings like this. And we might not actually want a tire plant back anyway. Um, that would be a hard conversation. But at the moment, it's high rate. Is, uh, is Dr. Hurt willing to lease this space out? Or are we just um, kind of on the assumption that he would be if we found somebody? At least a little bit. There, there's one small tenant that I have for just a little bit of space. Most of those big owners, they want to buy the building. Mm -hmm. So they, you know, they put down a couple million and buy it and fix up the that wouldn't be a lease operation. Gotcha. Um, but, so you know companies making great pads or um the one of the better prospects we had was for a um apple distillery using local produce and distributing nationally. Um that that plant might have been in Jersey. Um so just to answer your question yeah. excuse me jump in but please but also my experience has been that the owner has not been <clears throat> serious about doing much of that's what I've heard as well that's what I want that's been my experience sure. yeah. Yeah. now that may be changing who knows yeah yeah part of this work proceeds on like okay there is a willing seller and we try to match many right. in, in hopes of making that happen mm -hmm. um however um town comp plan calls for transformative redevelopment of the site we, we thought about all of those prospects and thought oh, <coughs> It would be better if there were not a big noisy factory with truck traffic and all um, going in there. So the comp plan calls for renovating that site. Um, and then our, our detailed work since then has involved fleshing that out. Um, so you might you might imagine a, a mix of uses with um, some residential in there, um, maybe some uh, age restricted homes on one bedroom floor plans. And then some other apartments that were two bedroom homes that were more interesting to families. And then a, a daycare center and a doctor's office, and maybe some lingering business space like um, appliance storage for that. But maybe put that in this big building instead of the storefront that they um, So we drew that starting in 2018. Uh, the, uh, Staff architect with the ARB at the time was a um, UVA architecture professor. So as a as a project for a couple of his graduate students, they drew they drew some sketches and they made a cardboard model, um, which has sat around the office since then. But it, it showed um, homes on the hillside and then a renovation in the plant um, with these nice open birds, people milling around, and a mix of apartments on one side and a um, uh, medical clinic and classrooms and some workshop space. And that sort of I still think that's a pretty good example for a hypothetical mix of uses. Um, one of the issues on that, Mr. Grisco spoke to, um, that zoning, we can't legally do that. We don't have a zoning category that describes that. Um, so the, the planned unit development zoning track the planning commission took a look at last week is a flexible tool to help make that happen. Um, Planning Commission will continue to work on that, but basically what the PUD does is provide for some case-by-case -case review of mixed use zone. Um, the list of by right and special use permit uses that you're used to see goes away. And instead the developer brings one design and it's all case-by-case -case approval. So if nothing happens without a town council vote on that site, um, but you have the ability to negotiate more of the details of the plan and mm -hmm. do them one at a time. A good opportunity for the factory site, maybe also for the um, for the Blenheim Road property um, to plan a mix of uses that's a little more creative than um, what we see with just our base site. I wish we could get something in for teenagers. Sure. I mean, we have we have playgrounds and the soccer fields and little league and stuff for little kids, and then we have the brewery and restaurants and stuff, and all these kids who are sitting around drinking at you know bonfires up in the woods. Mm -hmm. I feel like we could fit in there six bowling lanes, a couple pool tables, and two movie screens. Have a rated R movie and have like a family movie, mm -hmm. you know, for you know, people 
teenagers going on dates, families instead of driving all the way to Charlottesville to take the kids to a you know cartoon or you know whatever. I feel like there's nothing to do in Scottsdale for kids, and I think that's where a lot of the trouble with you know yeah, kids yeah. have something to do with their. Well, and we've heard that before. Yeah. Um, that uh, child care is an issue for all ages, and it looks different for three year olds than it does for fifteen year olds. Yeah. So the boys and girls club sees that their their teenagers drop out, and yeah. they sort of lose track of them. And that's mm -hmm. uh, that's scary. Yeah, but I feel like, yeah, 16 year old on a Friday night can go play pool and bowl and. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Um, so, what's the town doing to keep moving this state? Because um, we, we've set the, we've set those plans in place. We can work on the zoning. We can try to recruit those business investors. But until a, a deal is made between somebody who wants to buy this and reuse it and the current owner, we're a little bit stuck. Mm -hmm. um, so we can help them move that forward a little bit with some of our planning studies. Um, so there are there are two of those projects that are in progress. Um, the first I already mentioned um, is that floodplain update work. The building is still shown as being a floodplain. Um, we believe that's incorrect. They built a levy that's very similar to the one protecting the town at the same time that the town's levy is put together. Same engineer, same buildings. Mm -hmm. But where the town updated its flood maps in the 90s to the one that we have now, I don't think the factory ever did that. They had a levy, the paperwork to FEMA was difficult, they never did it. Mm -hmm. So we can check on that. The state is fully funding it, we'll take care of that. And that'll make things a little bit easier for a buyer in the future. It's got a different pump system, it? It does. It, does. it, it, it uses um, portable pumps um, mm -hmm. that you, you pull out of storage and install them when needed. It doesn't have a permanent building for the last house. Okay. Yeah. But the um, basic design. Okay. And do we have any sense for whether those pumps are still operational or are they just have to be replaced uh, in order to get the. If I were running that building as a landlord, I would have them on call with United and mm -hmm. they get me pumps on 24 hours notice. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, there is another grant in process now with decision very soon. This time next month, I'll tell you status on it. It's from a fund of the states called Industrial Revitalization Fund, um, which is designed to help repurpose white elephant buildings like this around the state. They've got $98,000 of planning grant money available to help us with a few of the due diligence items on this. We get a phase two environmental study all through that building, drill, drill in the soil and look for chemicals from these buildings. Um, I think that's okay. There are two phase one studies that are less detailed that didn't show any major red flags. But the phase two is important for any financing going forward and for the public to understand. Mm -hmm. um, take laser, laser measurements of the building. It was built in 1944. We don't have the as built drawings of it. So it's hard to get much more detail than this on renovation images without having measurements of it. Um, do a couple of architectural scenarios to go into a little bit more detail about that mix of uses. Talk to talk to neighbors and get more specific about what does the town really want to see there. We can use that to gather our result. And then do a traffic study based on those scenarios. Um, can the roads handle this renovation? What kinds of improvements would have to be made around those major roads? So that zooms us out a little bit, lets us see what looks like. With that in mind, I think we would have a pretty good package of data to give to any investor and say. This is what the town wants to see. We know the building is good. We, the investors, still have to pay for it. Mm -hmm. um, a million, two million, whatever place this package demands. Um, but here's something that the community wants and that the town is helping the town work for. Um, that's what we've been up to on the factory the last couple of weeks. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Matt, one of the things I want to say again is I really appreciate you seeing how you understood those properties that Dr. Hurt has and you've really driven this process, not just with the land, but also with the understanding <coughs> of the needs of the town. You know, when we lost the factory and those jobs and we had this idle place there and, and an inactive Dr. Hurt your efforts have really moved things forward. So I, I really appreciate that. And it's, it's come to a place where 
there really is the possibility to see some things happen and it would not have happened without without that public planning the processes we've gone through the abilities this is not a five minute thing this is not a, this has been a long process and the process that's gone on for a number of years to get to this point is really encouraging and it's been good public planning it's gotten a lot of good public input and it's been something that really is uh, come a long way and it shows you know uh, an opportunity for the town to be getting some revitalization that's much needed so thank you again for all that you're doing yeah i think these these the information we get from these grants is going to be extremely helpful in terms of generating more interest in the site so you know we walked around with somebody who was interested in putting in um buying it and, and using it as a green energy indicator. Yeah. So, you know, because it had offices, buildings, and it also had places where you could build small proto prototypes and stuff like that. But he he, he really uh, was scared off by the fact that it does not show it's not in a floodplain, even though it's got a, uh, a, a, a levee around it. And he doesn't know what's in the ground. So, you know, those were two huge questions that uh, that he was going to answer and, and piled on to his costs of, of trying to decide whether to buy this or not and scale it off. So if the town can answer those questions for him and not spend any money doing it, that seems like a brand. I think that's a, it's brilliant that you got these, these grants for this. So if you can get those, that would be huge. One of the things I'm going to say this, you've heard me say this before. Um, when I got my master's degree in public administration, I went other routes, and that's actually with his master's degree in public administration, you're seeing the fruits of what he does. It's been really good for the town, and that ability has really enabled this project to move forward. And I think, again, that seeing you know this younger guy do what he needs to do. We have another one over here, too, who's got this also. So it's, it's exciting to see you guys at work. And, the amazing work that you do on behalf of the town. I, again, having the same training, it's interesting to see it because I think a lot of times it's not understood or heralded. And the stuff that Matt has brought to the town with, with the grants, we just didn't have that before. It just wasn't there. I mean, so the, the work that's there, the, even the stuff with the police vehicles, I mean, a number of things that have happened. So, Matt, again, I thank you. And, and I say that because just like the police, this is a competitive world right now. The, 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 it's, it's a no-brainer. Thomas went on to something else he could go. So, I, I mean, I thank you, Matt, that you made a commitment to be here and you, you've helped us and you're serving the town well. This is, it's important. And uh, the guidance from council on my recruitment was, was clear about priorities. Um, flood control, small business development, and this site mm -hmm. as um, being blighted. And I've, I've described it that way in all these grant applications that it, it drags the whole town down for having lost 100 jobs two recessions ago and not replaced them. Yeah. So um, credit, you know, right back to town council for being very clear in those goals and, and providing that support every step of the way. It, um, it shows and it makes, you know, representing that to state and federal agencies a lot easier. Um, the town has been clear about what it wants. You know, the sad thing is all this, you know, how many of those places are like this across the state, you know, that are there and uh, the number is staggering, you know, that's there and the ability to creatively reinvent a place like this so that we can be uh, planning for the future is just, it takes a lot, it takes a whole lot. And, and again, we've come a long way. It's about 2,500 buildings like this one or newer. That of just sitting there in the country. Yeah. According to what I've read. Yeah. It used to be every little town had a mill like this, and some of them have turned into other things, and mm -hmm. some need help. Yeah. And there's very little, at least it appears to me, that there's very little uh, maintenance being done on this building. Mm -hmm. So it is slowly deteriorating. And at some point, it's going to get mm -hmm. past the point where. Mm -hmm. We can do anything with it. That's right. Does the uh, town have an ability to condemn a building in its limits? Just out of curiosity. Yeah. I, the way to do that would be fire. Um, okay. But it wouldn't be me, but it would be the state fire marshal. If, if we found unsafe conditions, 
um, that would be the way they can get it. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that happens, that this thing is a, is a death trap and the fire department says, we can't respond to anything safely. Now it helps that there's nothing around it. Um, mm -hmm. It's not gonna spread to um, adjacent buildings, but um, fire code enforcement would be the way to go on our condemnation. And if we condemn, if it was condemned, would what would happen next? I mean, we would just sort of ignore it and it would turn into a big jump pile, or, or um, does that change uh, the value yeah. of it? Or this, this is an important conversation. Um, yeah, yeah, it opens a different stream of grants mm -hmm. um, for brownfield management. Um, when you've got a site that is so messed up that nothing good can go there, mm -hmm. either because it's polluted or because it's low. You clean it up, mm -hmm. and um, the state has a brownfield fund. The EPA has a brownfield fund that you use to get those sites ready for something else. Okay. And so that would look like complete demolition, yeah. scrape the site clean, and you have a concrete slab that's ready to build something new on. And where would Dr. Hurt fall in all of this, as far mm -hmm. as the cleanup and the everything goes? Um. Depends. Um, condemnation is a very sensitive subject legally because it involves destroying someone's remaining property value mm -hmm. and they need compensation for it. So eminent domain taking condemnation involves paying them for their lost asset. Property value on this property has gone down over the years. It's easier to do that when that value comes closer to zero. Um, pollution issues are different. Those follow the person who did the thing. And we've got 50 years of litigation on that. If it were the case, and again, I don't think it is, that Uniroy or Michelin put something nasty in there, <coughs> there is still a company called Uniroy or Michelin that the EPA can go after to fix it. And they do that. So that, that would not be the town's problem. And again, the, the fire marshal issue, also not the town's success. So in both those cases, you know, we could maybe start the ball rolling on that if we cared to, but it wouldn't be our final decision. What would be your problem, though, is you'd have to do something with the building. Uh, and also, you'd have to pay Dr. Hurt for it. And you, may say it's, you may say it's worth $100. He's going to say it's worth 500000 That's the no. game that I play. Right. Uh, I, I defend governmental entities in that game. Yeah, yeah. Those, those, uh, those, can, be, those can be nasty. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so and if you lose, you'll have to pay him what the commissioners say it's worth whether you like it or not. One thing I will say from, there's a, again, there's one of the, one of the potential interested people in that factory that's interested in the factory is mostly interested in Dr. Burke's willingness to sell. It's not, it's not that it's the, 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 it's, this is, this is a place people want to use. This is not a- Yeah, I just, a I wasn't bringing that up to no, say no, that we should do that, but maybe as a tool yeah. to negotiate. If there is not a willing seller to be like right, right. So there are a couple of different business models that you've heard that work that are if the purchase price is one million and don't work if the purchase price is five. I mean, we've been approached recently by by people interested in this. So it's mm -hmm. and I say that only to say that a lot of it also is when people some people will say, Well, what about the factory? But really these people want to know what are we going to do with the houses? They want to see us pass the houses so we so they can work on the factory. That's what I so when we when we look at what we're doing here, if we want to kill the factory, then we kill the houses. I mean, real simply. So if the factory moves forward, the way to have the factory move forward to some level is is to allow the houses to move forward because that's what's of interest to people who want to do something with this building. At least the people that I've talked to. And, and, and they have interest. I mean, people are interested. Again, it comes back to, it's, it's like putting one piece of the puzzle together. You have to, I mean, anybody who puts a puzzle together puts one piece at a time. It doesn't all come, you don't put all the pieces of the puzzle. I mean, I don't know anybody. I'm not a puzzle expert. I'm amazing, man. I just dump it out of the box. <laughs> Got it all done. <laughs> it's an interesting analogy. Did a puzzle with my niece yesterday. Um, <laughs> do the edges first. And um, on this site, we have done the edges first. The confusing thing is in the middle. 
um, starting with the wetland use and the pink water so our, our comprehensive plan takes a commitment to the environment and water quality and affairs. And the first money to change hands on the site was the conservation of that. So I, I hope that signals our priorities. But we, we did the green space. I mean, we have, we have got this all teed up. I mean, it is teed up in a way we haven't done every piece that can be done, but it, it is, it's moved from an unwilling guy to a very willing guy who the best we understand. And the reason he's willing is actually because of the work that you did over the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and to create a reasonable plan that has showed him a way that he couldn't figure out himself real simply. Right. And again, thank you for doing that. But like you said, you were, that's what we tasked you to do. So we, I mean, that's on us. I mean, that was our, as you all are new for this process, but this process that we've been working on for several years has been with this reason. Yeah. Thank you. Well, um, well, no more on the Southern National Park. Okay, shall we move on to item four? A. Oh, okay. um, Mr. Briscoe mostly mentioned that, um, that there's a, um, there's a report coming out of Planning Commission on the small special use permit for the two Valley Street buildings, mm -hmm. um, the, the old Guilty office and the telephone machine behind it. So those will be yeah. on your agenda um, next week. Um, so the other one is call a public hearing for it. So call a public hearing for it. Call a public hearing for okay. okay. Um, you have for, for action is um, Planning Commission's previous work, the gas station, the GoPro 385 East Main. Mm -hmm. um, that one is advertised and is up for action, um, re returning to business. Um, those gentlemen, uh, Mr. Zane uh, and his team came by today asking about some of the design details. Mm -hmm. um, so they're, they're eager to do that. Mm -hmm. um, so it's the same gentleman who bought Lucky's? Is no, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, uh, Pronounced the same, but um, this, Mr. Singh, X I N G, has been here in town for some time working on other businesses. Mr. Singh, S I N G H, who bought um, Lucky's and has other convenience stores in China. So we need to find some more business. Mm -hmm. um, and, and of course, the, 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 the big one is um, the virtue special use permit. Mm -hmm. um, Happy to take more work session time to talk about status on that as, as you may as you may need. We had talked about possibly having uh, the applicant come in and do an overview of the additional work that they've done and any sort of proof that they have that this deal is going to go down in a way that the public can see it before mm -hmm. we go. Is that still going to happen somehow? Yeah, we'd be very happy to do that. You do that next week. Yeah, yeah um, just, why don't you explain that, Matt, what you just said, just so everybody is, is clear. Oh, um, there were a, a handful of community questions that have come up um, in our public hearings and from other public comments that the applicant has not had a chance to answer to. Like the, there hasn't been a direct back and forth, um, which is how our meetings are designed. But um, the, our applicant does have some technical information that they have not shared. Um, so I'm, I'm happy to provide them the platform to do that and kind of make closing arguments on their side um, mm -hmm. next week. Yeah, and they're, and they're doing that based on conditions that we have on the permit current. Yes. They're yeah. going to essentially show us how they're going to implement the conditions. That we have. Okay. Are they going to have an actual site plan? We are close to one. Mm -hmm. I know that's been requested. Yeah. The, the most the most recent document that I have from them is this. It's um, still just a sketch though. It's not an actual site plan, right? Yes. So site site plan looks like this. Um, and, and comes at the at the next stage. These are closer to construction status drawings. Um, this is the Tiger Seal example where Town Council approved its special use permits um, December 2020. And then this took another year to draw after that. Um, the applicant um, is never expected to move to this level of construction detail before a zoning vote. Um, but you could you'd be sure that this has 
sidewalk details, um, stormwater details, it go further. Mm -hmm. The most recent exhibit that they shared was this one. Um, and it goes into a little more detail to illustrate how they comply with all of the conditions that we've shown so far. Um, I have a couple of, couple of things on. Um, the total count of buildings is 36. Um, it has six duplexes um, here, here, and here. As they looked a little bit more closely at the elevation, they took one house from this corner and moved it up to the top corner because they weren't sure that it would fit with the slope of the road. So they gave themselves a little bit more space. I like this layout. It, it makes for a little bit more of a landscape entryway instead of sticking a house right on the corner. Um, so that's a change. Previous versions of this drawing had a house here. When they looked at the actual slope for a road, they didn't think that would work um, and moved it uh, to, the, to the bar. Mm -hmm. um, the, the basic layout hasn't changed. The other thing that's kind of new in this is um, another stormwater um, low area here. This would be a, like a rain garden, uh, a kind of mini weapon, where most of the rain on this site is going to the existing pond. When they look in detail at the contours of the land, they're going to need a little bit of it here. Um, the, the goal is for the pond and this rain garden to capture all the rainfall that falls on the site. So that there won't be cheap flow across the road anywhere else. Mm -hmm. um, the law is that they contain the flow on site. Right. Um, they'll be able to say more about the shop. Um, I just have to point. And again, that's back to the county requires that, that on the stormwater. Yes. So the um, the map of how much rain falls on the site and where does it go, the county engineer checks that. I'm not sure. Right. But so they're going to. Uh, have some type of presentation at council meeting Monday. Yes. Sir. Okay. And then when would you know we vote on the project? Um, you you could you could vote on Monday, um, or you could defer again. It sounded like there was council desire last month to act on this next week. Um, yeah. But you certainly can defer again and continue negotiate if you care. Mm -hmm. So the council last time deferred it to this week, mm -hmm. next week. So yes. It was like that. I had a question posed to me by someone and I should have paid more attention in civics class 50 years ago. Uh, could this have been put on a, um, a referendum in the beginning and you know had the town vote on it? We don't I don't seem to recollect too many things that the citizens vote on, yeah. but could this be one that could have been done that way? Interesting. It's improper to um, hold a referendum on a zoning issue. That's a legislative act, the responsibility of the town council. Okay, so that is that like a unwritten rule? Or no, no, there's all kinds of opinions on it. Um, it's been tried before. Uh, you're there. And <laughs> yeah, <okay. laughs> oh, yeah. yeah, the question was posed to me, and I didn't have the answer, so I wanted to have an answer for them. Thank you. It's called getting off the hot seat. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is good. This is already, I mean, this, this is helpful, you know. I also think as we go into this presentation, too, it's going to be like, know what we're looking at, too. We're not going to get, you know, those plans until we do vote for it. Right. All, what, we, what we need to see, and if you correct if I'm wrong, Stuart, is just sort of like how things are going to be laid out, mm -hmm. you know, sort of like measured distances. And I think even this is coming for you know the runoff, additional um, mm -hmm. stormwater runoff. That's what we're gonna. That's what we're gonna see, and that's the reasonable thing to see. Mm -hmm. You know, to um, to make a, a decision. So this is this is helpful. So to what extent does the condition, as it reads now in the in the proposed special use permit, mm -hmm. which says that <clears throat> what they're showing us now has to be what they build? How much would they have changed this given that wording if in fact they want to in the future? Good, good question. Um, the answer is a little bit, but not much. Okay. Um, and so Mr. Munson is asking about condition number one that mm -hmm. the site plan conform to this. Um, if that site plan comes back and it's very different from this, mm -hmm. we call that a zoning violation. And we say the, or the, it's an improper site plan. 
bring us a site plan action. <clears throat> um, that determination um, comes from me um, and, and the planning commission. Uh, is it accurate? The first thing we check on a site plan is zoning. Does it meet our zoning? Setbacks, height, density. And in this case, what council is making is a special law for the property rights on this parcel. Mm -hmm. That the only way these 36 houses can be built is if they meet all of these conditions. Right. So we need a way of enforcing all of that. Right. Um, and I've a couple of times have spoken to the value of having clear conditions mm -hmm. that we can enforce. Mm -hmm. If they wind up in court, right. Potentially, you know, it might be my determination that it doesn't conform generally. Mm -hmm. And they say, oh yes, it does. And we go to a judge over right. the word generally. Yeah. So so something, so for example, like what we're conforming to the site plan is like location of unit for structure and where they put the duplexes may not yeah. necessarily conform to this. Yeah, if, if right. the if the central open space went away and the houses were all pushed back really far from the street mm -hmm. and they tried to claim that the park area is now going to be like a wide sidewalk around the road, I would say no, that's not what we said. Right. So we're approving sort of like position of things. Yep. Okay. Yep. Number of buildings. Number of buildings. 37 is not 36. Right. Yeah. So Mr. Bowling, does that do you, do you feel that the verbiage for that concept matching is something that is strong enough to hold up in court to oh, yeah to, I do. I do. I mean, be more basically you have, yeah you have to realize that you you, you can't require uh in this case, if he had all the houses sold, I mean, it'd be, he could come in with a plan for you, but he's going to try to sell them. He's going to, uh, but I mean, this, this is a, this is not a complicated plan. It's not a, a, um, a, a cluster development that it's, it's pretty much laid out in lots. Uh, a num you designated the certain of them townhouses. I've looked at these uh, proffers over and over and over. You can ask Matt about that and argued about them and so forth, back and forth. And, I think what what's proposed is enforceable. Okay. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Mr. Rowland. That's important. Yep. We want to make sure in, in good conscience that what we have declared, what we have supported, what we have created is in line. It's clear what we're doing mm -hmm. and, and what we want from the property in terms of this proposal. So does the developer come in he buys this acreage, mm -hmm. propose, proposes for five four if it's past 36 dwellings. Um, looks like you've got four duplexes and everything else is detached homes. Does he build all the homes at one time, or does he build all the homes at all, or will there be different builders coming in? Um, it depends. <clears throat> That's not locked in. The property rights go with the land, not to any one party. So it might be horse traded several times. Um, you've certainly got examples on big projects where every builder in the region gets a piece of it. Uh -huh. Here, the scale is probably one builder could get it done, but you might see a mix. Um, you might see Habitat for Humanity volunteers on a couple of them, or uh, a local builder takes, takes a lot and does one else. Um, that's not something we can require. We can't say Joe Builder has to do the job or else I'm not doing it. So the first three houses could be built by one builder, for example, then the next three by somebody else. That, that happened in the 2008 recession. The project got half finished. The builder went bankrupt. Another builder picked it up a few years later and finished it. Right. Well, I guess what I'm hearing is that a, a development this size is unlikely to have multiple builders. And we have it's one. small. It's a small, right? Amount. Small okay. enough. Old Trail you know, has a thousand homes and right. ten different builders are looking. Right. If this, this, you know, I'm, this is just my opinion. Everybody has an opinion, but given the size of this development, it's likely that the the one developer can come in and, and contract to buy all the lots and then proceed to do it. He'll probably put some uh, uh, safety valves in there, so but they have to sell and where you. Where you might see two developers if you is if the first one can't sell them. In other words, he he, he builds five lots and then he can't move anymore. Yep. And that's certainly possible. Mm -hmm. And it's also possible that he could build all 32 and they'd all sell 
fairly quickly. I just, I just, you know, um, you assume that he wouldn't bid on it and wouldn't be really willing to purchase it unless he thought he could develop his his inventory in a reasonable fashion and sell them. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we've gotten some signals that this is a hot property. Well, there's, I mean, so, if you look at the real estate market, of the, I mean, the big picture, we know we need housing in Scottsville. I mean, it's, it's, it's a no-brainer. We need housing in Scottsville. And the overall market of, of need is, it's a, it's a market where it is right now. It might not be three years from now or whatever, but at the moment, it's, 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 houses are moving at the moment. Mm -hmm. The market said it showed that. Okay, anything else we need to talk about? Cover it all. So, appreciate everybody's being here tonight. And thank you, Mr. Bowling. And uh, thank you, folks, for attending in the audience. And uh, if there are no further questions, we will. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Merit.